ลงพอครับ how I wanted to ask you um, how how important it is to to, to How, how important it is to uh, to have a good teacher, and and what the relationship should be like between the the, the teacher and the student, aside from obviously what is laid out uh, in the vinaya, and also um, well, what's the criteria that one should should look for in in a potential teacher or in a in a teacher that you have already. Would, if the real teacher is the Buddha, so you've got the, you know, it's very well, kind of clear teaching in itself. Uh, so, you know, you more or less have to do the best you can with that until something happens where you find uh, an, a teacher, you know, that you can, that you feel faith with, you know, to to live with. And uh, that you can learn from, because you can't just, you know, not an act of will. Just you, there's something that happens where you have faith or confidence and, uh, in someone and not in someone else. So with me, it was meeting Ajahn Chah, I found him. Uh, you know, I wasn't even looking for a teacher. I was just looking for a place to stay. And then. Then I met him, and then I, you know, I felt confidence in him. But the thing that that I always felt co- that uh, the confidence arose because he was never pointing at himself. He was always pointing at Dhamma, you know. So he was, you know, he, he's not trying to. You know, I was afraid when I went to stay with Ajahn Chah because I already had a year of practice. And I felt confident in the kind of insights I did have, and I was afraid that when I went to that he Ajahn Chah would be another one of those teachers that say you have to do it like this and walk slowly and I don't know give me another method of meditation which I didn't want. Uh, and so when I met Ajahn Chah and he asked me, you know, what my practice was and and how, you know what I. You know any insights I'd had during that time? He 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 never you know he just said keep doing that you know he didn't he encouraged me to in, in what I was actually confident in rather than he kept telling me I should do it his way, and so that increased my confidence. And and I never felt he's ever pointing to himself you know he's never never you know, he was very charming. Person, he had a a, a a charisma, very strong sense of of personal charisma, and a very appealing personality. But it never was. You never felt it was kind of you know he wasn't using it for to uh, to make you dependent on him or to you know to. Bind you to him. It was always he used. You know, he, once I asked him about it, I said, "You're very charming, Ajahn Chah. You know, wh- you know wh- why why do you use so much charm with teaching?" He says, "It's my magnet." He says, "I use it. I draw people in with charm, and then after a while, they might listen actually to Dhamma." You know? <laughs> so, it was, and and I did see that. He, he, he was, uh, you know, never. You ask him what's your attainment, or he just laugh. You know, he wouldn't answer questions of that order, and and uh, it, and every time you wanted to start kind of clinging to him, and and that he'd he'd get you to look at what you're doing rather than encouraging it. You know, like I'm your only teacher, and don't go to any other teacher. Never never heard him say that. You know, don't you? Look at anyone else. I'm. You have to devote your life to me, and I never heard anything like that. So it was. It was uh, always. You know. So my my confidence and trust in him increased over the years. Cause I did. I found that so helpful to to not feel uh, I'm being exploited by anybody, 
or being kind of pulled in and, and bound into into some kind of guru relationship but more you know this is this man this particular monk actually trying to get me to wake up to life so I wouldn't trust teachers who constantly point at themselves to them. <laughs> or give you a lot of you know I'm I'm your teacher you can't look at anyone else that kind of thing because even even at one time you know uh, one monk got so inspired by Ajahn Chah he said I want to take a lifetime vow to be a monk for the rest of my life and Ajahn Chah's reply was the future is the unknown <laughs> now I was inspired you know lifetime vow that's a quite inspiring thing but but uh, Ajahn Chah was was kind of seen this this monk particularly was in a stage of you know I wanted to devote my life to the Dhamma and and give my life to it it's all quite beautiful and inspiring but he wasn't supporting it in in the sense that it, it's you know making this monk make that vow he's pointing to the reality the future is unknown you know right now you don't know what's going to happen in the future and so that that's a real direct pointing at the way it is rather than than uh, binding you to a to a, a statement of inspiration because those you know your mood changes all the time you know you feel I want to be a monk the rest of my life and the next day you want to disrobe so <laughs> so you you know you can't trust that that kind of uh, feeling but you can be aware of it it's really an interesting question because we like um, we're kind of a community since the time that Lung Po Cha isn't around anymore that doesn't have that figure or like that that uh, charismatic uh, magnet that pulls the face from the start so we we tend to do our kind of try to get along without like and over 20 30 years it, it kind of worked <laughs> we're still here and and without any charismatic uh, person and yeah, just kind of find it interesting. What, like, but yet there is this, the, the the longing to have a teacher, and certainly the abbot can't be <laughs> presently be that one. <laughs> and and so how do we practice with that? You know, like, uh, and maybe there's the wish we find the arahant teacher, um, say, somewhere in Chonburi or somewhere in in Chiang Mai or so. And uh, but yet we're living in this community, which yeah, kind of uh, doesn't have that charismatic magnet that we sometimes need. Kind of. Well, it's, it, what, do you, what do you need? You know, what are the necessities? Uh, what is absolutely necessary for enlightenment is Dhamma and, and then Vinaya. So it's like here you've got teaching the Dhamma and the Vinaya is the respected. And then you've got four requisites. You get shelter for the night, robes, food and medicine. So this is how, you know, like getting people to reflect on that this is all you need, you know. So then you begin to see your discontent, uh, you know, thinking, I'd rather go stay with that Arahant up in Chiang Mai. Or, and so you're, you're encouraging people to look at this rather than, than, uh, than thinking, well, you know, supporting the idea that, that, that there's something wrong, there's not something better than somewhere else because that's another perception and uh, so like in, in uh, because people you know we suffer from discontentment and, and you stay in any monastery you get tired of it after a while you, not any place looks better than the one you're in and, uh, and but it's more important to see that rather than to follow it and, and what is it important is, uh, is, is a, like for me the Dhamma is Four Noble Truths the, the Sutta Sutta style Dhamma 
and the Paticca Samuppada and things like this. This this this, this, this Satipatthana and they've got this is very much encouraged as you know on a Bariati level and then to practice with it. So it's it's complete. You you can't the Four Noble Truth is actually perfect teaching. It's not there's nothing amid, there's nothing lacking in it. But in terms of if everything else were lost, you know, some somebody destroyed the whole scripture, all the scriptures, leaving only the Tamajaka Pavata and the Sutta, that'd be enough. You know, that, that, I found that absolutely, you know, that says it all. But then, uh, but then it's not and just on a Bariati level; it isn't very much. So you know, but bhakti bhakti is then then the, the the practice. It's a lifetime of practice of investigating until you become so clear that you know insight, knowledge becomes so strong that that you get beyond the doubting of it. Uh, because, like, I found living with Ajahn Chah uh, something that that I, you know, because I did trust him and admire him, I could, I could easily learn from him in a positive way and I could also serve him and, you know, to massage his feet or to do things for him and bow to him was always kind of a pleasure and an honor. And then, then I went up to, uh, to another branch, branch monastery where the head monk I didn't respect at all and, <laughs> And uh, and neither did the Thai monks there, you know. So they get together and talk about how awful this monk is, and uh, you know. So then I started contemplating, you know. He is not like Ajahn Chah. He's kind of crude and and uh, does stupid things and and all this. So so then uh, you know I could justify even feeling. I don't even want to bow to him because, you know, you know, it's just not good enough. But then observing this, this I'd learned from him a lot, you know, about my own conceit. And, and just, you know, not thinking that, you know, learning from somebody I didn't respect. But the Dhamma Vinaya was there. The four requisites were adequate. So, I mean, you know, in terms of what was necessary was complete. And then it's just a personal reaction to, to the head monk, who I didn't have faith in. But actually, because I did learn from him about, you know, I saw my, my conceitedness. And clearly, you know, that Ajahn Chah is worthy of my respect, but you're not, is really quite pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> so then, you know, like this is where Vinaya helps to kind of oil the wheels, the mechanism. So you, you're not just coming from personal, you know, feelings about anybody, but you're doing, you know, it makes, you're doing what's right according to the Vinaya so that, you know, it doesn't matter about your personal feeling towards the, towards the senior monk. It's not, that's not the issue anymore. But everybody would like a perfect teacher, but Ajahn Chah would, you know, he'd send us away, uh, you know, to live with others. And, and uh, that was, you know, who you didn't have maybe respect in the same way, or you didn't like even, but, but you could still learn because of the encouragement to be aware, rather than it. I have to live with somebody I can really trust and respect is still Sakya Ditti. Also, you learn from the way it is. So, you know, you, you can think, I've got to live at Wat Bapong, I'll live with Ajahn Liam because that's the only place I feel safe. It's still, you know, still creating a suffering. So it's, uh, it's, it's, this is where, you know, like learning to trust your awareness more rather than, 
and getting dependent on a particular monastery or style that that you become addicted to you know you become so you depend on it and feel insecure when when those conditions aren't present so that's where this awareness practice helps you to see where you can adapt and flow with life and not just be you know get fixed on it has to be like this otherwise I can't practice and and when it happens you know it's certainly wonderful I mean like uh, I, I was with Ajahn Chah during his kind of peak years and uh, I'll never I feel very fortunate you know to have uh, that and you know I would I miss him you know I kind of think of him and and um, but yet, you know, when I went to live in England, you know, it was like suddenly I was, I remember seeing Ajahn Chah at the airport. He went back to Thailand and left me in England, in London, and I felt like an orphan, you know, suddenly deserted, left there in a foreign country. <laughs> and, but I could observe that, you know, I didn't didn't make it, grasp it or believe in it, but you still feel these, these, uh, you still feel life. And, and even when the teach, even when the head monk is very divisive or temperamental or untrustworthy, it's still, you can still learn. You know, if you, if you trust your awareness. So it's, uh, you know, you, you, it's, you know. Sometimes monasteries do have have a lot of harmony and and uh, some are key. The sense of work harmony, social harmony, and su- supporting each other. But if you depend on that, then when it it's impermanent, like everything else, and and other Liam is impermanent. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we, we all thought when Lung Po Cha became ill that, you know, oh my God, what are we going to do, you know, but there's, there's enough, you know, the power of the Dhamma is so, you know, here and now, it's not dependent on one month uh, support, you know, keeping it alive. It, because when Lung Po Cha became ill, then many of us had to rise up, you know, in a way we didn't have the the great charismatic teacher that that we felt, you know, we compared ourselves with and always felt, you know, he's the great teacher and I'm just the, you know, the the one who's his follower. And so, remember, uh, Ajahn Chah had this stroke at Tham Seng Pit uh, while I was in in England. And uh, and so they've told me right away, but it was during the Vasa, during the Pansa. So I, you know, I had to wait till after the Pansa. As soon as the Pansa, I went to Bangkok, and he was in the Chulalongkorn Hospital. And then he, and Pabakro, Ajahn Pabakro wheeled him out in a wheelchair, and he was just sitting there like a sack of potatoes, just like this. And and I was with. Uh, Mayor Bao, who is one of his devoted supporters, a Thai woman, and she broke down crying in front of him, and 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 I started crying too. I felt this incredible grief. See, you know, Ajahn Chah is so strong, a personality, charismatic kind of magnificent man, and he's just like sack of potatoes like this, and seemed it's so depressing to look at. And, and you felt this grief, and then I then I just felt at the time I said that this woman is you know wailing in front of him. What he must feel like, you know, if I go and wail in front of him, you know, and what did he what did he teach me to be aware, you know? So it became clear that the best way to that, that I, you know, to because re- I felt this great love for him, I I wanted to, you know, for the sense of wanting to repay him was to practice what he was actually teaching, 
And he wasn't teaching, you know, I'm the great teacher and when I die everything will fall apart and and if I change, you know, and become a sack of potatoes, that's the end of Buddhism. <laughs> it's, it's, it's much more, you know, it's, it's Dhamma that's managed to survive 2,551 years. Uh, it's got its own power. And it, sometimes it, you get charismatic teachers like Ajahn Chah come along, but you can't depend on that. And that, 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 that's not going to be, don't, don't wait for that to happen, in other words. Don't wait for some charismatic teacher to, to, you know, carry you, but, you know, learning to awake and trust yourself. Not trust your views and opinion, but that awareness. Trust it, because it, it is something, it, that is the only thing you can really trust, because like Ajahn Chah there, Buddha Dasa there, and Lumpur Liam is not going to last all that much longer. And, you know, these kind of charismatic great teachers, they they die just like every other creature. But the, the Dhamma, you know, has sustained itself. And, and you, you know, it's always amazed me how, how appropriate it is to, to modern Europe. You know, it's so, you know, it's not an old-fashioned Asian teaching. You know, it's not like something from the past. It's about life itself, human being human, and the problems that all humanities had ever since the first one. You know, and suffering, the causes, and, and the ability that this human state has to reflect on suffering. You know, so that we can, we're not just helplessly caught in the realm of suffering without any way to understand it, but we can actually use suffering to free ourselves from it. And that's what the word Buddha really means. It's, you know, it's a weakened consciousness. Not a person. It's not Gotama the Buddha anymore. It's just, it's, it's you, it's me. It's a weakened consciousness that is here and now. That, that we, you know, and we can use this, recognize it and appreciate it. then our conditioning, our human uh, limitations are then seen and not taken personally anymore or clung to or identified with. And can I ask, how, how can one create, like, the, the power of the Sangha, like, carrying the momentum? What kind of practices can help to the feeling like um, yeah, having a, a, a powerful feeling of living together in a community. Well, it's, it's like, this is, this is a very important question, actually, <laughs> because it, it's, uh, because Western, generally speaking, Westerners, we're, you know, are, we're so individualistic. And, and like I never really had a, a sense of a community before. Uh, from my background, it was just uh, asserting yourself and being independent and and uh, not depending on others. The sense of you know I can take care of myself was very much my cultural conditioning. And so I never developed a sense, even with my own family, my mother and father, and I never developed a kind of bond as a as a, like a, with Asian people, they often have a very strong sense of bonding with their families. I didn't have that. And was, the whole emphasis was on right, human rights, my rights, and what I think, and my individuality, and my independence. So those kind of perceptions, you know, they weren't all that conscious, but they were influencing how I picked up monastic life here and then uh, then in the Thai monastic system you see then you you know you are incredibly dependent on others so like Ajahn Chah you know wouldn't allow you know for years he would not allow electricity inside the monastery or pumps on the wells 
And so you had to work every afternoon drawing water in these uh, kerosene tins, you know, and you had to pull, a group of monks would pull it out and then you'd have to carry it on bamboo pole. You had to, two monks would carry a couple of these buckets of water. It seemed so primitive, you know, to me. So I, and then uh, lay people wanted to buy pumps for the wells. You know, I thought that's a great idea. And uh, so I asked Ajahn Chah why he refused, and he said because he wanted us to develop that sense of working together. And actually, I never really thought of it before. You know, it uh, it hadn't really registered, and you know, the sense of togetherness, working together, and I found it difficult because I, I'm culturally not attuned to that I, I like I'm very more like a hermit at heart or I like a, being alone and uh, rather than you know I'm not socially kind of intelligent I don't I don't love society in other words so I had to learn how to uh, you know, work through that, my own reclusive, based on fear of others also. And, and uh, Anjan Shah insisted that I, you know, every, every opportunity I took to try to get away from it, he pulled me back into it. And so I began to just stop trying to get away and just observe. And in, uh, but this is, I think, Anjan Shah's genius you know, when you look at, uh, you know, in Theravada Buddhism uh, in the West, uh, there's, there's so many kind of independent monks, you know, Theravada monks uh, teaching the Pasana and whatnot, but, but not very many live as a Sangha, can, can work as a Sangha. And this, I see, was, was Lumpur Chah's genius, was he did help us to appreciate the sense of Sangha and like Vinaya uh, and, and these, uh, this sense of, of community because it is a refuge you're not taking refuge in my rights and what I think you know but in in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, Supatipano Ujupatipano it is a practicing those who practice and you know, and, and that have this common ground of uh, commitment to Dhamma, which is non-personal. It's not say who's who practices the best here, and who's a real, really good. I'm a better meditator than you. And that get back into Sakya Ditti. But it it remains much more. You're letting go of that whole whole role of of competition or judging yourself or and comparing yourself with others or forming views about other monks and then listening to each other like I found that I had to learn how to listen to to others and you know I was quite good at giving advice and telling people what to do <laughs> but actually listening to them was something I'd never really cultivated in, uh, in lay life. So, and then to live together, you know, like in a community, it's, you know, if you're just telling each other what to do or just, you know, kind of judging each other, criticizing each other, then it, it, you don't want to live there. You know, you don't want to live with that in this kind of gossip and judgments and and then you form factions and then there's always some some monk that gets is a scapegoat and people get hurt and your feelings get you feel resentful and on and on like that. But so learning to listen and uh, and not just listen with a sense of reacting and trying to set them straight if you don't agree but it's learning to listen and, and listening to others when they say things that you don't like 
you know, and without feeling you have to say anything, because you can be aware of your own maybe disagreement. And this is much more, you know, then then it's possible to live with each other, you know, because, you know, how can, you know, how can you, you know, if we all have our own vipaka kama to work through. You know, some of the worst mistakes I've made in, you know, living in communities where, where I've had attitude I want to, you know, I didn't, I wanted somebody. I didn't like the way they were, so I wanted to change them. So, <laughs> I, you know, I'd, I'd get this view, this monk shouldn't be like this, and he's got strange ways, and and he should change. And, and then I would, you know, I know, I wouldn't say that, but, you know, you pick it up, you know, you naturally kind of sense this, that I don't approve of you or don't think you should be who you are and then then that they then the monk reacts very badly you know you get a lot of negativity from them and then you can judge them and say well see that monk is really difficult and you know but then then I began to look at my own you know I began to see my own sense of I don't like the way you are I want you to be what I think you should be you know? by listening to myself, you know, how I would see somebody else, I think that's really, that's like you're busy, isn't it, you know. I want you to be, I think you should be what I, you know, I want you to be what I think you should be, and that's, uh, that's ridiculous, you know. It's a ridiculous demand, totally impossible demand made on somebody else you know, learn how to, if they're going to live together as a Sangha, how they, how, how to do that. And, and you can't do it if you're just, you know, using your power or your, you know, you're kind of bullying them or creating, you know, forcing everybody to, to do it your way. That doesn't work. You just get endless, endless resentments and nobody wants to live with you. Don't go away. Monasteries go through phase just like you do individually or anyone. You know, kind of has phases where they everything seems inspired and then reaches a peak and then it becomes disillusioned or you get bored or fed up with it. And then... Uh, and then it starts again. <laughs> so, I mean, that's where where you observe the the rising sea sea <laughs> of condition and all. <laughs> yeah, we do that so many times. It, the initial enthusiasm reaches a peak, and then it all stops. Uh, people are getting negative and. But that's where also I've learned the most, where where I've been most criticized and put to the test of where everything I've seemed to have created is now falling apart. And it's in, <laughs> interesting to see, because, you, you know, you, my confidence in, in awareness is so strong that, that I know, you know, I, you know, can uh, see the whole process as a part of, you know, awareness practice, rather than just trying to, you know, feel successful or, you know, for trying to always feel that you have to hold the monastery and lift it up and keep it, hold it together. And that's, that's very burdensome. You know, the, like in England, trying to hold it together and, and the feeling of, Without me, the whole thing's going to collapse. And I saw, I couldn't, you know, that was just, uh, just, you know, on a, a sakyaditi level, it was just unbearable to feel I have to spend the rest of my life 
trying to hold this thing together and it's kind of overestimating myself you know thinking without me the thing's going to fall apart but then I found out it doesn't <laughs> <laughs> it was a kind of relief you know 